So to everyone listening, welcome to the fourth webinar of Selborne College and the Selborne Association um, as part of the 150 Jubilee celebration. Um, this webinar is going to focus on engineering and architecture. Um, I'm Dave Hartwanger. I'm a teacher at Selborne College. I teach physical science and engineering graphics and design. Um, yeah. And prior to my teaching career, I, I worked for 20 years as a mechanical engineer, having studied at Wits University. So the, the two main objectives for this web, webinar are one to celebrate the, um, the achievements and successes of the Selborne Old Boys, which the Selborne community at large is extremely proud of. And the second objective is to listen to your stories the paths you've taken and the insights that you have now and the reflections and advice that you might have for the next generation of Selbornians coming through. The, the format for this webinar is I will briefly introduce each of you and you'll have uh, four to five minutes to speak about um, your particular interests and the things that you're currently passionate about. And once everyone has had a, a chance to speak, we will then move into a Q&A session. I will kick that off with a few questions for each of you, and then we'll open it up to our broader audience. So without any further ado, I'd like to begin um, in no particular order. Um, our first guest, Mr. Mark Chu. Mark matriculated from Selborne College in 2011. He studied a BSc in Civil Engineering, followed by a Master's in Geotechnical Engineering, both at the University of Cape Town. After which he worked as a Graduate Geotechnical Engineer at Mainhart Consulting based in Shenzhen, China. After a year in China, Mark decided to take his studies further and is currently a final year PhD candidate at the University of Oxford, reading for a degree in Renewable Energy Structures where his research will contribute to the design of offshore wind turbine foundations. Hopefully I got all of that correct, uh, Mark. <laughs> oh, perfect. Thank you very much for the intro, David. Um, yeah, you. and honored to be part of the seminar today. Uh, I never thought I'd be given such an early opportunity to talk about my short, illustrious career, uh, where my head, I feel like, barely matriculated from Selborne not so long ago. Um, I love my time at the school and I owe it a great deal. Um, from my early days in the college, I really enjoyed uh, maths and EGD. And while I always knew that I wanted to challenge myself, um, knowing what subjects and what career path to follow uh, was a truly daunting experience for me, especially during, I think it's a final year or in grade 11 when you're applying for university. Uh, I kind of believe that it's quite rare for someone to have that true calling in life whether to be a doctor or a chemical engineer or an actuary at such a young age. I feel like you only really discover these things once you progress in life and you uh, get exposed to more. And I'm sure some of the speakers later on will share how their career paths may have changed over the years. Um, engineering, for me at the time, seemed like a logical step. It was about solving real life tangible problems, which I thoroughly enjoyed. And while friends and family may have played a part in me selecting this, it wasn't until some of the teachers and mentors which I came uh, across paths which would help me in this, uh, which, which helped me select this path. Um, one such teacher was the late Dr. Nitt, my then EGD teacher. Uh, he really piqued my interest in engineering and was always there to encourage me to do my best. Um, so looking back, I realized how fortunate we are to attend a school like Selborne, uh, where we have such incredible teachers who are truly passionate about the subject uh, that they are teaching. As an, as an undergraduate, there were many courses I both enjoyed and loathed with a passion. Um, however, it wasn't until I took that geotechnical engineering course given by Professor Columba, we had developed a real appreciation for the field. Um, geotechnical engineering is just a branch of civil, uh, which makes use of principles of soil and rock mechanics to aid in the design of foundations, tunnels, retaining structures and other earthworks. So with this interest in mind, I decided to pursue a master's of Professor Columba from 2015 to 2017. Um, those years were tough, 
uh, but I wouldn't change a thing. Uh, however, soon after finishing, the thought of doing a PhD was probably the furthest thing from my mind. So with uh, nothing tying me down, down uh, and no further commitments in SA, I decided to work in China for a year. Um, in Shenzhen, a large tech city bordering around Hong Kong, um, the company, as I mentioned, but as mentioned by David, was Mineheart, an engineering consulting based company. We were taking on a lot of infrastructure projects in Southeast Asia at the time. Um, and while I was working there, I was not concerned about the pay, but rather the experience and uh, how much I was getting exposed to. I was really willing to do anything, working overtime, working on the weekends. As long as I was learning, I was happy with that. Um, the first month was extremely tough. Um, the company there's probably only one person out of the 500 in the company that could speak english um it was a steep learning curve uh, especially for someone whose mandarin is only on a conversational level um, but i quickly found my footing and was able to establish my role in the company and and now and my work included the design of retaining walls uh, for tunnel portals a lot of slope stability analysis a lot of stormwater drainage design and a ton of report guiding it was about five months into my new job where my former supervisor again, Professor Columba, forwarded me this ad for a studentship at Oxford. And while it seemed like something that was far out of reach, um, Professor Columba truly believed that I could get it. And it's very hard to say no to him, especially after he sent a draft of my reference letter, of his reference letter that he would uh, send for my application. So I applied, had the interview, and got the position for a fully funded PhD studentship. While extremely exciting, uh, it was extremely weird, considering that I was gonna be a student again. And the, I was in the mindset of remaining in China for the long term. Um, so it really highlights very quickly how one's life could change. Um, but nevertheless, applying for position has truly been a blessing in disguise. Open up, it has opened up a ton of doors for me and it's taken me a step closer into becoming the type of engineer I hope to be one day. <clears throat> when first arriving, everything, or well, first arriving in the UK, Oxford, everything seemed again daunting. I uh, wasn't I sure. Just... Um, oh, yeah. Thank you very much for that intro. That, that's been brilliant. Um, I, I have a million questions I'd love to ask. But, <laughs> Not a problem. <laughs> Um, just in the interest of time, um, I'm just going to cut you off. We'll come back to you, um, but I'm just no, going to yeah, move no, on absolutely. to. Okay, thank you. Um, our next guest that I'd like to introduce is uh, Mr. Jason Stain. Uh, Jason matriculated from Solomon College uh, in 2014. An eternally proud Selbornian, he sought to fly the school's name high, performing strongly for the first rugby team and also, more importantly, receiving academic honors. Jason graduated from Harvard University in 2020 with a Bachelor of Science in Mechanical Engineering, and he's currently working at a, as a processing engineer at a 3D printing startup in Silicon Valley, USA. Jason, over to you. Thanks very much, David. Can you hear me? We good? Yeah. Um, just, just checking, is the sound good there? Okay, mm -hmm. great. Um, yeah, thanks guys. So obviously, as Mark said, like massive, massive privilege. Um, the, it is very, I think both myself and him considered very early in our career to be giving advice, but nevertheless, like, thank you so much for giving us the opportunity and always good to give back to the school that gave us so much in the beginning. Um, so I, yeah, I went to Selborne, graduated in 2014, um, obviously grade eights through 12. I studied biophysics accounting because I thought, well, I was advised that those were the most heavyweight subjects and they would carry me the furthest. Um, and I still wholeheartedly agree, um, having become an engineer. Uh, I got my academic honors, played first team rugby. After graduating, I went to University of Cape Town for a brief stint. Um, I was heavily involved in student government whilst I was there. I started a degree in mechatronics engineering, focusing mainly on the electrical and the computer science side. Um, but, and I played rugby whilst I was there. 
after two years though i saw that there were a lot of opportunities opening up overseas um and so i started applying to countries like australia and to the united states and i was extremely fortunate to get the nod from harvard so i went over there and um, i transferred and finished and officially got the degree in mechanical engineering so that's what i ended up with over the years um, i worked in quite a few different fields i worked in an automotive manufacturing firm i'm sure you guys can guess which one coming from east london um, then i worked so i worked as a robotics welding engineer there after that um, i worked within washington dc as um, a private equity analyst analyzing performing market research doing due diligence um, building financial models and structuring deals. Um, after that, and most recently, I've become a process engineer where I focus mainly on um, 3D printing batteries, um, solid state batteries, trying. Um, and I was thinking like, what's, how is this going? Like, what, what could, if I had to go back in time and if I had to talk to my previous self, what would I tell my previous self? Um, and I think Mark's point was very valid. Like we, for, for many of us, following our passion is the number one thing we could do. We want to play these long-term games. We want to play like in the same industry, in the same geography for as long as possible. Because if you play the game the longest, you develop the skills the longest, and then you will by therefore be the biggest differentiator within your field. Not a lot of us know which field we want to go into. Um, and so, if you like me at my age, when you didn't, if you didn't know what field you wanted to go into, I would suggest you research um, fields that are grow growing into the future. It's important that you don't want to go into a dying industry. Um, search fields that are leveraged, meaning that you're not simply exchanging your time for money. That means like you can, these are fields that are highly scalable. You can write code that can scale to 100 million users. You can go into like, you can go into finance where you put in a small amount of money and it turns into a large amount of money. And then the last thing is I would make sure that these are fields that you are interested in because the fields that you're interested in are the fields that you're going to want to do the most. How, what does this look like from an SA standpoint? Um, it means trying a lot of things and accepting that the first degree that you do is not going to be the one that you probably stick with. So it means doing as many internships as possible in as many different fields as possible um, so that you realize which is the field that you gel with the most. And then once you develop that, you go really hard on that. And the last point that I would just want to emphasize is the first job outside of university is crucial. Like if you work for a huge company, a very reputable company, Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, Google, Goldman, Investec, you have that stamp of approval and you can literally save yourself 10 years, 20 years, and honestly change your entire life just by doing just by getting a good job. And this starts early. It starts within first year of university, second year, third year. So it's very important that you take university very seriously. Yes, it is a time to like network and have fun with your mates. But at the end of the day, the job is what you're going to do for 30 or 40 years. And if you can give yourself a 10 or a 20 year head start, that is extremely valuable. So that's my two cents. Cool. Thanks very much, Jason. Thank you. The third guest that I'd like to introduce is uh, Mr. Jed Weber, switching now from engineering to architecture. So Jed matriculated from Selborne College in 1993 after completing his architectural degree at the University of Port Elizabeth um, before practicing from firms based in London, the United Arab Emirates and South Africa. Jed has substantial experience working on projects of international significance in the UK, UAE, Greece, Poland, Turkey, Spain, and South Africa. His project experience spans a full range of projects ranging from international airports, industrial uh, mega projects, proposed new African cities, complex large scale cutting edge design projects of international significance, private homes, schools, clinics, mixed use developments, automotive supplier parks, commercial office buildings, office parks and world-class industrial buildings. He has developed a broad knowledge and skill set relating to large-scale complex projects, including those embodying cutting edge technical design and fast track delivery requirements. Welcome, Jed, over to you. 
Gosh, thanks, Dave. Nice intro there. Uh, yeah, guys, I uh, reiterate that we are incredibly privileged to come from an amazing school and a grounding platform. It's, a, it's literally a springboard to the world going to such a good school like we all have done. We're incredibly privileged and all of you still at school at the moment. I don't think you appreciate how powerful that connection to the global community actually is. Um, I never knew exactly what I wanted to do. I, I kind of, I was not a great student at school. I played water polo, played a bit of rugby. I enjoyed socializing. I enjoyed my friends. And I kind of did the bare minimum just to find my way through. I never really challenged myself as much as I, I should have at school. <clears throat> but always knowing that I was a creative, I loved my art, I liked history. And I enjoyed building. My dad was an architect, but uh, he was more of a slave driver who saw me as cheap labor um, to work for him on weekends and lay the bricks and do plastering, which I didn't really appreciate because I would rather be playing rugby or water polo. And I didn't appreciate at that time how good that grounding really was. Um, I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. It was either medicine or architecture until about grade or standard eight. Um, I knew I loved both, um, and then I realized that I, I got, had an opportunity to travel once or twice with grandparents, and I saw the amazing buildings um, that the rest of the world had, and, and I appreciated how it made me feel to go into these spaces that just opened your mind into what was actually possible, um, and that spurred me on to a very clear path to say, right, it's going to be architecture and ended up at UPE uh, again. My first year I just scraped through. I thought I enjoyed the freedom of getting out of school and the, the structures that you have um, being in a small town like East London. And, and then I realized this is what I need to do and to really good, good, get good marks, I've got to find myself, which I, I tried. I was lucky I studied with Carl, who was on here as well for a number of years. Um, Anyway, I, I wouldn't say that the education at UPE was world class. It was a good grounding, but it teaches you to think differently. When I say differently, different avenues, and, and there's no set path that you're following when you're in that, that environment. It, it challenges you to, to find your own path and what actually makes you tick, which is quite a different mindset to school because you, you're in a, in a pretty rigid framework when you're going through school. Once you get to university, you, you kind of have to find your own path. And um, I enjoyed that and graduated and ended up going to, to London. Um, I applied there to a couple of firms and I ended up working for a firm that was specializing in retail, but working on projects around Europe largely. And ended up in a design position there where I again became that slave, which I quite enjoyed, much like Mark. I was just loving the opportunity to, 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 to get involved and learn. And we were working in Poland, Greece, Spain on, on amazing projects, but working 17 hours a day, six days a week. And it starts to grind you down. Um, I loved it, make no mistake, it was for high profile clients. You know, you, you're enjoying being part of a team, enjoying bringing drawings that are on paper to life. And those projects start to come out the ground and it's incredibly rewarding. Um, but the time that it takes to work in that kind of environment in a different country. I was struggling to come to grips with the culture. Uh, a lot of the time people spend in pubs. Wasn't really what I was into at that stage. But you know, you've got to, you've got to be part of a team and the rest of your team's living that life and you're mixing with them. You've got to start to roll with the punches and otherwise you're going to become ostracized. So you, you've got to find your way. And especially with you working with not just a number of Brits, you're working with people from around the world in an international firm. Um, I ended up getting an opportunity to, uh, with retail experience, funny enough, um, I got approached by a number of very big firms in London to, to, to join them. Uh, one was to go and work on Arsenal's new football stadium, which I actually accepted the position, uh, only to have to change my path a couple of days after that, after giving getting another offer to, to go and work on Heathrow Airport's new Terminal 5, which was going to be the biggest construction project in Europe at the time, um, and in a, in, a, in a lovely role. So I had to go and apologize 
profusely turned down Arsenal football stadium to go and work on Heathrow Airport. Um, but it's probably one of the best things that I ever did. Um, amazing environments, amazing building, amazing teams. Um, you know, the whole structure and, and no blame culture that they brought to it in a, uh, in a way that you don't blame people for what they do. You find solutions. Um, you're not working for a, a, a brand of company. You're literally working for a project and the benefits of the project, which is a very different mindset to what I'd experienced anywhere else. And most of you will find. Um, anyway, ended up finishing my role with Terminal 5 and got moved by my company to go and work in, in United Arab Emirates on crucial projects for the sheep there. Um, and ended up finding my way back onto airports in, in Abu Dhabi. Um, but along this path, um, at a very young age, I was actually diagnosed with cancer while in the UK. Um, probably one of the best things that ever happened to me because it made me realize how short life is and you just need to do what makes you happy and, and chase that path. Money is not everything because you might be dead very soon. So you need to do what, what makes you tick. And um, I got into airports, spent a number of years working on that, living in, in hotels, great life, high-flying life. But I'd met a woman from South Africa while I was in London, and uh, she wasn't too keen on staying in the Middle East, even though the career path was looking fantastic and the bank balance was looking great. I had to make a decision, do I follow my heart or do I follow my career in a foreign country and earn the big bucks? And I made that choice to follow my heart and I ended up coming back to South Africa not knowing what I was going to do next and um, ended up working back in East London on, on one of East London's biggest projects ever, building the East London Industrial Development Zone for supplying Mercedes-Benz. Um, again, applying the skill sets that I've learned overseas to a local, a local you context. Don't mind, um, could I just interrupt you there? Um, sure. Yeah, I think you've actually in a way, you've already answered the, the first question that I was actually going to ask you, but uh, um, I'll, I'm definitely going to come back to you with a, with a few other related questions. Um, no um, I apologize for, for cutting you off just in the interest of, of time. Um, we just no need problem. to move, you know, move on a little bit. Um, I'd like to introduce our, our next guest, uh, Mr. Carl Heinz uh, Richter. Carl matriculated from Selborne College in 1992. He studied architecture at the Nelson Mandela Metropolitan University, Port Elizabeth, and holds a master's in business administration from the University of Wales. Carl started his career working as an architect, then as a design team coordinator and development leader for complex building projects. He's an entrepreneur and has co-founded several companies, entity partnerships focusing on urban regeneration and property development, Engaged X, focusing on thought leadership in social impact investing and I assume you are focusing on developing software to help manufacturing companies decarbonize their supply chains. Carl lectures part-time at the Frankfurt School of Finance and Management in Germany focusing on sustainable finance and ESG data. Carl, I believe you're currently based in London, is that right? Or it's It's been changing a little bit, so I was in London and now in Northern Ireland after British Stinton in Berlin for a few years. So, so lots of Welcome change. Welcome and over to you. Yeah. Thanks, David. And great to, great to see the other panelists and Jed. Great to connect again after all these years. Um, yeah. I think just listening to that bio, there was a lot of changing uh, and changes in direction. So I think maybe I'd like to focus on those changes of direction. Everyone can read the bio and the stuff that you do, but it's really maybe also useful focusing on why people change direction and what benefit that brings or what the lessons are so maybe the first um sort of taking the first route which was heading to berlin straight after matriculated i, I was planning to study architecture there I, I had a similar experience i think mark you mentioned mr nitt at that time he was teaching metalwork and so i was really enthusiastic and enjoyed metalwork um really valued uh that time and the direct exposure but also what the old boys were doing and um helping influence and shape in small ways so it's great to be able to pay that back in some way and so i left i went to um berlin 
I was planning on studying architecture there, but um, for several reasons, decided to come back to South Africa. Um, one, the winters are really, really cold, um, and it's much better studying uh, near the beach in Port Elizabeth. Um, there were also several other reasons around uh, having thought I'd escaped uh, the army in South Africa, only to find that in Germany on my 18th birthday, I, I got uh, a letter from the government saying they would really like to see me in the German army, and I didn't want to. So, <laughs> so I I went back to South Africa, um, but and then that's when Jed and I actually started. I think we were in first year at this, in the same year. So. Um, the first the first takeaway there is is just that the value of that gap the value of traveling the value of exposing yourself as deeply as you can to other cultures and other experiences and allowing that to to really go in because um as others have said you know i think once you, you might have a reasonably good idea at school what you what you want to do what you think you want to do but the real world brings its own interests and challenges and um experiences and it, i found it really really rewarding to just um have that base layer uh, before I went into university. I studied architecture, two degrees at, at that stage, um, and then I started working as an architect in Port Elizabeth and did several things. If you've ever um, landed or taken off from the airport in Port Elizabeth, there's a, an Impala jet on a building. That was that was one of my um, first tasks: is to put a, a jet on a building, which is a really interesting challenge. And, and then I got involved with a casino project, the Boardwalk Casino. Um, and that was fascinating because I'd left university with all these really um, somewhat noble, somewhat naive ideas of how to change the world and make it a better place, only to find out that a lot of the key decisions had been made by the people who were allocating the finances and the money. And by the time I got along on a very, very commercial project like that, um, there was very little scope to actually influence change. So that's when I, that's what prompted me to study the MBA and really influence the flow of money and realized I needed a business degree. Um, I was still in PE, so I was studying at the PE Tech, although um, the degree was conferred by the University of Wales because it was an international collaboration and it gave me a British degree and I paid the premium. I think I I thought long and hard about whether I should pay that premium for the international stamp. Um, and in hindsight, it, it, it was a no-brainer. Um, you know, that, that international mobility that um, it gave was, was phenomenal. I then, after uh, doing several other projects in Port Elizabeth, decided I wanted to go to a big city. So uh, instead of maybe one of the other cities in, in South Africa, I thought, well, let's see what this attraction is around the world, um, in London particularly. You know, that's where a lot of South Africans ended up going, and I did as well, thinking it might be a few months, but it ended up being several years, if not, yeah, I think 13 years or so. Something like that. But um, again, lots of lots of changes. The the MBA had allowed me, I think similar to Jason, what you were saying, it had given it felt like it catapulted me 10 years in my career, and it had given me a lot of opportunity to select the next chapter. And the next chapter involved working for um, a multidisciplinary design company in, in London, building design partnership, and working very closely with the client side and all the different disciplines and seeing how uh, that design process had to be coordinated. And maybe if there's any anything as a theme in what I've been doing in design thinking and applying that to different domains. Um, I was interested in property development, uh, was very fortunate that the uh, chief exec of the, of the company was also interested uh, in that. So that's when we set up our first company together. Uh, um, I was quite young, he was quite senior, so it was a really good combination. We had the financial crisis that got me to think, well, where did the money go and how do we get it back? And how do we make sure that we find money that has a, a social purpose? Because um, it often the motivation attached to the money influences and shapes you know what ultimately gets either built or or um uh or funded in in, in a broader sense and so that got me interested in uh, social impact invest investing or impact investing or sustainable finance the idea of bringing the, the non-financial and the financial together in a purposeful way and there was a lot of work theme 
and then more recently, and I'll, I'll finish on this point, uh, focusing on coming out of the financial sector, and and uh, that pivot was was triggered by, in a way, I suppose the the opposite of what got me into uh, following the the flow of money, which is realizing when when it comes to sustainability issues and how business affects people and planet more generally, all of that happens in the real economy, and um, that's where we need to have uh, data solutions. We need to have data. There's a big gap of data, and so. We're now building software solutions that help fill that gap of sustainability data, particularly around carbon emissions, um, and in a way that I suppose squares the circle. Thanks very much, Carl. That was very interesting. Um, I'll, I'll finish on that. Data. <laughs> and uh, now, finally, to our esteemed guest, yeah. uh, Professor Ian General. Professor General uh, matriculated from Selborne College in 1981. He is currently Deputy Vice Chancellor for Systems and Operations at the University of Witwatersrand, where he previously served as Dean of the Faculty of Engineering and the Built Environment, and as Head of the School of Electrical and Information Engineering. He is registered as an International Professional Engineer and is a registered professional engineer with the Engineering Council of South Africa. He holds directorships of Crown Publications, Global Africa Projects, InnoPro, the WITS Digital Incubator, Outreach Engineering NPC, Power Optimal, and the ESCOM Expo for Young Scientists. Ian is a trustee of the Accenture Education Trust in South Africa. He is an executive committee member of the South African Academy of Engineering, and he is passionate about engineering and engineering education. Uh, welcome, Ian. It's an absolute privilege to have you on this uh, webinar. Um, over to you. Thank, thanks very much, David. Now, I, I just do want to start by making a couple of observations. Number one, I'm, I'm incredibly humbled to be amongst all the folk that you've got on this call. And I think the key thing is to remember, I'm really represent history in this particular panel. I mean, listen to how young everybody around this room is and what they've achieved. I, I, I think what I would like to say, however, is the following. Number one, it, it, there's no wrong answer in choosing your career path. And I think that the most important thing to understand as a youngster at school is very few of us have the privilege of leaving school truly knowing what we're going to be doing when we're 25, 35. I mean, I still don't know what I'm going to be doing for the rest of my life. I've got some ideas, but they're never going to be what I thought they would be. And I think the most important thing to emphasize is why did I do engineering? And, and, and I mean this most sincerely. I did engineering because when I was in Sub A, I wrote a, a thing in some funny kind of language, holding a pen like this, which said, when I grow up, I want to be an engineer. My mother showed that to me when I was thinking about careers. And she said, she was a teacher. She said, don't do teaching, do something else. So I ended up going to do engineering. I chose electrical engineering because I truly didn't understand the electricity part in physics. So I thought this would be something to try and get my head around. And I, and I discovered that it was a, a really a lovely choice. I think the other important thing to emphasize is that everything that happened after that was truly, and I think everybody in this room has said it, it was truly a matter of recognizing an opportunity and not letting it get away from you. If I can say it as bluntly as that. Life is made up of so many opportunities. The key thing is to truly understand what you're gonna find rewarding in your life. And I want to emphasize being happy about what you're doing and truly believing that you're contributing to a better world, I think is far more important than pretty much anything else on the planet. And I don't want anybody to forget that. It's important to believe that we're making a difference. So engineering, and this is why I did it, I felt was one way of doing things better for the planet. Let me tell you, we've made some fascinatingly big mistakes. So every single one of you out there, if you're gonna go into the professional world or become an engineer, become an architect, anybody in the built environment, there are so many opportunities based on so many of the things that we got wrong. But I went and did my undergraduate career with an ESCOM bursary at, at WITS. And I ended up then working for Eskom. You got a four year scholarship, you did four years working for Eskom. When I was at university, I was absolutely enamored with what was then called control and instrumentation. That was the division in Eskom that I worked in and it fascinated me because digital, uh, it sort of a distributed digital control theory was coming out at that stage. It was all exciting. The University of Hawaii was discovering that when you started sending radio signals and they clashed, you didn't get good comms. So how do you sort that out in the network? This stuff fascinated me back in the day. And remember, this was a hell of a long time ago. And then what happened was I joined Eskom and they were commissioning a very new technology in high voltage engineering. 
And for whatever reason, one of my professors said, you know what, why don't you have a look at this thing? And here's the thing. What I did for Eskim by mistake turned into a PhD. So it was never my intention to go and get a PhD, but I worked on a real world project. And in parallel with that, I was doing a PhD. So it was like one of those magical things. And I've spent a lot of time often with students in industry explaining that sometimes there is that opportunity to balance what you're doing in the work environment with actually being recognized through the, the award of a higher degree. So I got a PhD almost by mistake. And when I got that PhD, I ended up joining the staff of its university in 1990. And um, I must tell you the following, I've been incredibly happy. I really enjoy what I do. And I think the key thing is if you're not getting out of bed in the morning and saying, this is what I want to do, then maybe you need to step back and ask yourself what you really want to do and actually be honest about that. Because if you're not having fun, and I'll, I'll confess to you, every day, there are some really bad moments. And I had some really bad moments trying to run part of my university remotely today. There's some very bad moments, but at the end of the day, those bad moments give you the right to truly enjoy what it is that you're doing. And I think that's the key. The last thing I want to say, David, is one of the reasons, and I don't want to be biased in any way, but one of the things that I can tell all the youngsters who are interested in engineering in the broadest context, and I did metal work at school. You know, you don't have to only do the academic stuff. You do the stuff that you enjoy. Do it because you enjoy it. You've got to be good at maths and physics. That is true. But, you know, one of the most important things is to recognize that if you go into an engineering discipline, and engineering isn't just engineer, there's engineer, technologist, technician, skilled artisan, artisan, there's a team that makes up engineering. And the most important thing is to recognize that our South African degrees in engineering, all of them, every single one of them actually is internationally benchmarked. Every single one of them is recognized through the Washington Accord as being internationally comparable. And that is the reason that people that like myself can be registered internationally to practice. And I think that's important to recognize that while there's fantastic opportunity in broadening your horizon in foreign universities, and please do that, the base degree our professional engineering degrees in this country across the board are absolutely world-class. The last thing is if you go into engineering, it doesn't matter what flavor of engineering you do, whether it's aeronautical or biomedical or industrial or electrical or information, you learn the same skill sets. And what that means is you can get out of here. You can go into consulting if you really want to. I don't think that's too great. You can go into a corporate world. That's probably even a little bit worse. But you can also go into entrepreneurship, innovation, and get involved in those startups and do really, really cool stuff. The opportunities based on the challenges that this planet faces are, they, they should keep you awake at night, but they should also remind you there's work to be done and we can do it. And I think that's the key thing about engineering. It kind of opens those doors to so many options and so many opportunities. That is not to downplay what happens in the built environment because obviously engineers and built environment professionals work very, very closely together. But this is, this is a choice I made, probably a little bit by mistake. I'm delighted that I made it. And the career path I followed to now being a deputy vice chancellor, honestly, wasn't my plan. But what can you do as long as you're having fun? Thank you, Professor, that, uh, that was brilliant. Um, right, gents, uh, I'd like to now move into the, the, the Q&A uh, phase of the webinar, and um, I'm going to kick it off with a few questions for each of you. I'm, I'm going to go back to you, uh, Mark. Um, yeah. You know, a couple, of, a couple of the guests have mentioned uh, BSc, MSc, you know, doctorates and so on. Um, just for the benefit of our younger audience, could you briefly um, explain what are the main differences between going to study a Bachelor of Science in Engineering, a Master of Science in Engineering, or a philosophy, um, a Doctor of Philosophy in Engineering, just rough, roughly? Yeah, absolutely. So, or like uh, Professor Glenrell said earlier, uh, there is, in terms of doing a Bachelor's, you can go into all sorts of different fields. Um, and that is kind of the baseline at the moment within the country. We have tons of people doing these batches, not just within South Africa, all sorts, all over the world. And sometimes to give yourself that edge when getting that interview in a job, having a master's actually helps. Uh, and some may decide to pursue doing that. A PhD, on the other hand, is slightly, well, as a master's, you do specialize somewhat in that field. A PhD, you go even deeper into that field. Um, but then, deciding whether or not to do a PhD, that kind of depends. Um, how does that actually add to your career aspirations? Does that help you at all? 
and what sort of, in terms of what sort of project you're tackling on, sometimes it may be funded by industry, as Professor Janiel said, and sometimes you may be doing work which is relevant to our day. And on the other end, you could just be doing work which is uh, broadening the knowledge of that particular subject. Um, so it, it does depend whether or not which one you do. A uh, master's seems to be uh, almost essential, especially here yeah, within the UK. Everyone seems to have one nowadays, and to get that interview, uh, everyone's got a master's. Um, so, um, yeah, I guess that's my two cents for that question. Okay. And, and maybe just um, following on from a couple of comments that you made earlier, I, uh, I got the impression that there was a particular professor involved in your education that was quite influential and yeah, um, <laughs> part of your motivation to move on to a PhD. Um, is, 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 have, I, have I interpreted that correctly? Oh yeah, 100%. Like I was, like I did well, reasonably well in school, but it was I always just believed in working hard and being kind to the people you meet. And I just had a ton of help along the way. And the professor, Columbo, was just, uh, yeah, he was just a very, very nice person, respected me, I respected him. And um, yeah, he was just very passionate about his work. And I suppose if there are other teachers out there listening to this, uh, that's what they, like they can change someone's life just like that, depending on how they teach a subject. So yeah, I was very fortunate and to cross paths. And somewhere along the line, he, he had a little bit of time for you. Yeah, well, it was just, I think he just was one of those. He he must get so many applications for all sorts of PhD uh, ads or studentships that come through his emails. And he's like, hmm, he may just have you in the back of his mind and forward you one out of the blue. So, um, yeah, it really is about the networking, about the people you may meet and when the opportunity presents itself, as a lot of our guests have spoken about today, you grab on, hold to it with both hands. and. You go for it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And that's ended up being a blessing in disguise for me. Cool. Thanks very much. Um, Thanks, Dave. Jason. I, I've got a few questions for you. So um, I'm quite interested in the in the startup that you're currently working for, um, working on on pioneering the the solid state batteries. Um, again, just for the benefit of the of the audience, can you briefly explain to us what, what are the benefits of solid state batteries compared to our current battery technology that uses liquid electrolytes like what are the what's the big deal nice nice technical question if i butcher this please forgive me <laughs> uh, um no essentially so in all battery or well, simplifying it like in every battery you have a positive you have a negative and then you've got a substrate that the electrons move through charge well, a battery delivers power through the movement of electrons moving through either liquid or solid. Um, all traditional batteries these days are liquid, but if you know a little bit about physics, you know that the particles within liquids are dispersed quite far away from each other. So that means that the electrons have to travel, forces of attraction are lower, and the electrons have to travel further distances in order to make the trek cross from the negative to the positive or the positive to the negative, depending on which um, direction you are working with, tradition or working with. Um, and essentially in a solid, solid state batteries just means like having the positive and the negative end, but replacing that elect liquid electrolyte with the solid. Now that means that the atoms are closer, the electrons can be transferred shorter distances. And so what that means is that you can, essentially charge and discharge batteries at a much faster rate, which means that your electric vehicles are much, much faster because you can deliver power more quickly. Um, it also means that you can charge your electric vehicles much faster. Um, your cell phone, you know, it's, it's, it's really, um, it is the holy grail of batteries and it is a very, very, very valuable technology for the person who gets it right. So you, you kind of in a little bit of a um, a drag race with companies mm -hmm. that are working on this technology. And I guess the, the first company that gets the a viable commercial product out there is, is the winner mm -hmm. to some degree. Um, is that right? Um, it is and it isn't. I mean, like, like, yes, it's important to get like a viable commercial product, but at the same time, your 
like it, it also has to meet the industry standard like we can't if you have a battery that can only last like one cycle we can't just like even though that's a viable commercial product like it's not going to match the industry standards of like tesla that will survive like a very large number of cycles so it's important that we get it up like the first i think the first company to get a good battery that is the same capacity and cycle life of the current standard batteries and can do better they will be a very very rich company indeed but there's definitely in short there's definitely a big advantage to being the first player on the market um especially mm -hmm. if the timing's right microsoft iphone um google mm -hmm. all of these guys were essentially first movers to market um and if you can dominate the market early on it's a huge advantage mm -hmm. So as a young guy, you've you've joined a you've joined a startup that is obviously shooting for um, a high target, mm. where there's potentially high rewards, but there's also also high risk. Um, mm. And uh, you, um, you, you, your your other responsibilities are fairly minimal, so you can afford to risk everything. <laughs> Yeah, there's a saying that I read somewhere. It's like, if you're going to go broke, do it before 30. Um, and I don't know, like me personally, like I, I very much like innovation. I don't, um, as Ian was saying, like going to a big corporate is even worse. Like I hate big corporate. Um, I'd much rather be in a startup environment. In a startup environment, like because there's a low number of people and like you have to get your hands dirty. You have to do a lot of different things. So that means like you develop a lot of skills. Like you develop like marketing the product, like building certain technologies like if something breaks like you're not going to have like another department to fix it you have to fix it um so yeah it, it is a lot of risk but i think that the learning experience is actually way more valuable than any like risk i'm assuming i mean the worst case scenario is that like like the company like hypothetically like the worst case scenario is the company goes bust and i have to move in to my back to my parents' house, and then I find another job, and I go back out again. So, and your parents are doing fine. <laughs> yeah, they, they, yeah, they're doing fine. They are in South Africa, so it would be quite a long flight, but you know, we figure it out <laughs> eventually. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Thanks, Jason. Of course. Thank uh, you. Cole. Um. Yeah. Uh, th thanks for your intro. Um, uh, I'm quite curious about one of the companies that you co-founded. Um, engaged X. Um, the, the concept of of social impact investing, um, and and kind of the the gist that I got from the intro is it's always a good idea to follow the money trail. You know, mm -hmm. in, in, in you're doing, but just to just to better understand uh, social impact investing, can you maybe um, run through an example or two that that we can sort of wrap our heads around yeah. yeah um so there could be there could be any number and i think a lot of the people on the call are probably working on projects that would qualify but um renewable energy might be the easiest one to to think about and get your head around because um you know you're producing a, a sustainable form of energy but at the same time there's a, a market out there that will pay for the energy and uh, with that you can finance that project in a in a fairly conventional way so you're talking about debt or equity financing um, it, it can be financed with commercial capital uh, as opposed to requiring subsidies from the government or a foundation or a charity or something like that um, there might be a lot of things that are novel about it we've spoken about risk but at that point you know that's what uh, commercial capital is there to do is to look and find the the opportunities and find the aid be prepared to to take that risk so the you know there also there will be examples on the social side but i think the the core fascination there was was um was finding the the overlap between what previously and traditionally was spoken about in terms of saying well if you're going to be doing social good or environmental good um you know you might do that after hours or at the end of your day after you've made a lot of money destroying the planet or people's lives but actually how do you fuse the idea of 
purpose and and commercial activity whether that's commercial business or commercial finance and it is possible even though it does take a little bit of adjustment sometimes have you had any direct involvement with any projects in south africa not recently um i mean the the there have been several yeah several conversations and i think uh people from south africa influencing the debate certainly um if you now go to uct there's a very strong impact investing uh contingent or department and it is growing um i think that's also i think the the biggest thing maybe on that issue is the language and by language i mean the words that people use so for a, a long time in south africa it, there was the idea of social impact investing but people might have been talking about it under the label of developmental finance and so um often maybe with with things that are novel and innovative people are just using different words to describe the same things and it, uh, even if you you know there we're, we're all trying to research things in english the same language and you then look at what's going on between different languages people are using more than just different words and so there's a bigger challenge to maybe find the connections that are genuinely there so that's an interesting point i mean that's that's more on the that's not hardcore science that's the soft skills of yeah people communicating mm. yeah mm. and 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 learning how to research and knowing what to look for and how to look for it yes cool thanks very much jed if i can come to you for a minute or two um you mentioned at the end of your intro sort of some of the reasons why you uh, decided to put your roots down in south africa you met your wife, had some help, wanted to other things, um, and that was fascinating to to listen to. That you you made some career choices that were not career based. It was it was personal issues. Um, but I, I'd like to maybe touch on touch on something else. Um, the the idea of of sort of um, high tech architecture. Uh, that that concept um you've had a bit of experience uh designing schools so obviously now i'm talking up very much from, from my ex current exposure working within a school building um and we're living in a changing world we you know we've thanks to covid certain things have been um, accelerated like online platforms and so on um in your in your view how do you see the the architecture of of schools advancing um, or developing within the next sort of five to ten years very good question um i think this conversation uh, is it's amazing how what i'm currently working on engages each and every single one of us on this platform um I got involved in designing a new city to make the world a better place around Nelson Mandela's house with the Mandela family and some international investors that came to a very abrupt halt with COVID. But that city was about making the world a better place. And it was about a lot of thinking that I've been doing while I was back in South Africa about how do we do that? How do we bring about equal education for all? We're very privileged to have gone to a school like Selborne, and that's not, not because we are brilliant, but our parents had a bit of money, um, more than, than most. And when we see schools around the country, you will cry to see the situations that they're dealing with and the challenges that they're facing. Um, one of the things that I'm busy with at the moment is a, it's a company called the John Normus Group. It's actually in Delaware in the States, I founded that. And that's about building the houses of the future, which is essentially building houses like cars, uh, using possibly solid state batteries, and uh, all sorts of green technologies on the roof to solar power them. And they use hydroponic uh, atmospheric water generators and hydroponic farms bolted onto them. And they're completely independent of the municipal grid. Um, 
one factory to be able to produce about 450 of them. And they've got technology built into them, which are essentially education platforms linked to their own uh, uh, their own search engines and operating platforms, which would be engaging education. So essentially, all you need is one of these tiny houses, which are off grid. You link to Wi-Fi, internet, and in internet education platforms. As long as you've got access to to the internet, you can educate yourself through a myriad of different platforms that are available to you, and you therefore would have no more excuse. You would have support through your technological platform with your own uh, education platforms like a Google uh, school. All of these are coming online. We've been working with a, a group out of Singapore that are pioneering this space to try and change the world along these lines. And that's what future African cities are going to need to be. We've got an average age of 17 on the continent, open to, to innovation. Uh, these are green projects. They are recyclable, uh, carbon neutral products. And we would be designing the cityscape in which these products would be placed. Um, so those are going to become the future of the education platforms. We're going to do university education online, much like we've changed right now uh, with the COVID uh, working from home scenario. And many people have done the university degrees online. Um, there's no reason why our Harvard University lectures that currently only lecture to a couple of hundred people, that lecture cannot be available online on YouTube. And all you have to do is to watch it and get your biometrics checked to be able to get your credit for having attended that lecture. And that goes into your data bank that you've actually been there. Um, so those platforms are coming online and they're moving very, very fast. And very, very soon, we're gonna have educators are gonna be the superstars of the world, in my opinion. Um, you know, if you're making very good content and your peers recognize that as being amazing content um, and as peer reviewed, the fact that you've watched it as a student based in Mkranduli out of your tiny home online, you've got a credit for having watched it, is amazing. Um, so I think that's where we're going, you know, simply to raise the amount of money that we've got right now to, to build a build, built environment, to build a new school. You're talking about a program of six, seven years from planning, environmental approvals to get these things done. It's far quicker to, to, to bring about equal education opportunities using technology available to us to do that. And then our social space is going to change that are going to respond to that right from university education through schooling. Um, so that's what I'm currently working on and involved in at a very large scale. And each and every single one of us here, when you talk about what you study, nowhere in my life before did I think I'd be in here, but just having worked on the future city around Mandela, Mandela city got us into the space. And so that's, it, it's running away from us. Um, so at the moment we're talking about trying to plan factories to build 450 houses and how we transport it on railway links to be able to move them because our road infrastructure can't take them. And where do we build these batteries and where do we get the raw materials from to make them to be able to supply these houses that are off grid? And how do you make them recyclable? What do you do with the battery when its life cycle ends? So having studied architecture, it's now linking all of this together in a very, very close way. Um, to try and make the world a better place. And that's what makes these career choices so exciting because they change and they challenge you at different levels. So we don't just build buildings. Um, you know, first you shape the buildings and they're after the building shape us. That's one of those famous sayings and, and, and it's totally true. So yeah, that's, that's it. Education is going online, but we still need to create those quality spaces to have meaningful personal interaction with our peers and friends. And I think that we're on a rapidly changing world right now like we've never seen. We've been pretty stagnant through my generation. And now I think it's a time for innovation. Um, you know, we can't maintain the status quo. There's a, a very good book called The Bottom Billion, written by a guy called Sir Paul Collier that Carl's probably very aware of. Um, about what we need to do. And those opportunities, I believe 100% are on Africa. Um, we're gonna be the second biggest population to China. Um, that's where the markets are. If you're not here, you haven't got a place in the world. And 
the opportunity is going to be around engineering, architecture, the built environments and creating cities and spaces that people want to be in. And it's got to integrate technology at every single level. So those of you listening to this right now, I'm 100% excited for all of you because anything that you go and study right now is going to be different in 10 years' time. And that's the excitement that you, you need to look forward to is that life's changing grab it with both hands and there's a saying in rugby what said can you take the harbour that harbour is up there right now you don't know which way it's going to bounce when it bounces in front of you and you're going to try and catch it when it bounces and that's that's what you're all going to do when you come out of school shortly cool uh thanks jed i think you've touched on a, a quite a few very interesting points i'd like to follow up on on a few of those points with uh, with professor general um uh, Mr. Sure. Parsons is bugging me for for that we might be running out of time, but anyway, we're gonna we're gonna push on here. Uh, Prof. General, um, maybe just before we get into the question, um, you've been at Wits quite a long time, and um, I had the privilege of of being at Wits when you were there, and uh, when I think when I was in second year engineering, I was doing a course in electrical engineering. Which I found extremely painful, but um, you you were the lecturer, and um, I must say you did uh, you were one of the most um, flamboyant and um, uh, enjoyable lecturers I had, and I think that that alone kind of got me through. So <laughs> I just wanted to mention no, that. Fine. But um, I, I put two and two together there. I'm quite alarmed at how young you are. It's fine. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'd like to touch on what, what Ed was talking about with, with the uh, online education. And obviously, you know, the two years of COVID have kind of forced aspects of that on us. Um, you're involved with the strategic planning for online learning at WITS. Uh, how do you see it going from a university point of view? Because I think in many respects, you know, schools kind of take their lead from, from the initiatives uh, driven at university level. So, you know, can you give us a little bit of an insight into, let's say, the next five years? Sure, it's a very good question. So I, I think the first important thing for me, and I, I think I, I'm, I'm delighted that you touched on uh, electrical engineering. And, and, and one of the things I used to do when I was head of school was I felt it's really important that the most senior staff member in the school lecture to the first year class. So since 2001, I found myself lecturing to first year electrical engineers. And I lectured a thing called electric circuits to them. And electric circuits is something where you can do a hell of a lot of stuff in theory, but you've got to go and burn stuff in a laboratory to get your head around it. And I convinced myself very quickly that oh, you really can't do all of this stuff online. And I'll tell you what COVID taught me, and I'll come back with a, with a right runner, is that there's a lot more you can do in a brilliant online environment than we ever thought was possible. So when I look at what my colleagues were doing, and I was still Dean when, when COVID started, and it was like, how do we do this? The kind of stuff that was presented and prepared in a virtual environment to allow folk to literally go through almost a practical learning experience was completely and utterly mind boggling. So I, I want to put that out there and say that I was actually thoroughly impressed with what you can achieve online. So let's put that aside and say we can do a hell of a lot more online than we think we can. And we can probably do a lot more online than we've done to date, no matter who you are on the planet. But I do want to make the following interesting observation, and that is that one of the things that we stuck to very strongly during COVID was getting youngsters with carrying certificates and heaven knows what else to get through all the blockages into the laboratories to experience the practical world. And I think one of the reasons for that is that even if it's building up your portfolio in an architectural environment, which you can do on your own, but it's so nice to sit around with people and actually What's the word? Squeeze the flesh with folk to say, this is how we're tackling this. So we spend a lot of time making sure that the practical opportunities are still available. And I think that it is important to recognize that at the university level, when you're talking about folk going out into the profession, you know, when you release them onto the world, the last thing you want a grade to do is to kill somebody. So they've actually got to have really dealt with the reality of what happens if you get something in a high voltage laboratory wrong. And, and what happens when you get it wrong is something you'll never forget all of your life. That explosion just doesn't look as good in a virtual environment. You've actually got to smell the smoke, right? You've got to smell that. You've got to sense the ozone in the air. You've got to understand that there are electrons being stripped out of molecules by a high field right in front of you. So I think there's an element of that. But I think the one thing I do want to say, when I reflected on what changed for me during COVID, 
and I had my son is in third year now and he went he was basically invited to orientation week and then told to go home and everything was online effectively he's doing digital art by the way which feeds into an engineering degree which is phenomenal but the key thing for me was the, the, the students who became our best postgrads were those youngsters who walked with me back to the lecture, back to my office after a lecture, and didn't have the courage to speak out in the lecture. Do you know what I mean? And they'd walk up to me and say, "Prof, do you have a moment? Can I ask you about a problem I'm having?" Or I don't kind of get this. So I think that 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 interesting interpersonal thing, and I believe that there's a virtual solution to it. But that interesting interpersonal thing, where you literally look into the eyes of somebody right next to you who's facing challenges you've never even, you've never perceived. And then helping them through that and analyzing that and developing, developing that very close human interaction, I think is actually very important. And I think that we're never gonna lose that. So we need to figure out how you take the best of both worlds, right? And I think that's the kind of, that, that sort of hybrid environment where you, you pick up what can you do online, which is far more efficient, all the comments made by everybody, everybody in, this, in this discussion. And then what is it that we need to make available practically for people to interact and by the way it doesn't imply and this is interesting to me that it need be at one university campus if we're talking about universities these could be opportunities created by 20 universities working collaboratively around the world and i think that's so exciting and so important we've got i mean at our university we've got a couple of joint master's degrees with american universities which is such an opportunity the online environment made that even easier to pull off right so I think there's a lot that we can we can think about going forward. No doubt about it. Cool. Thanks very much, uh, Prof. That was fascinating to hear. Um, Jens, I believe we have we have a few minutes left, and for those listening, um, I'd like to open the invitation to please send through any questions. Um, you can email them directly to Alan Parsons at alanp at solborn.co.za or um, you might be able to post them directly on this chat through the, the chat icon um, that you're on. So if you have any questions, please send them through now. We have about two minutes left. David, while you wait for questions, can I just say something? And I mean, I'm talking as the, the, the dinosaur in the room, right? If you look at all these youngsters in this call, they all said something so important and the point they all made was that you have to keep learning you have to keep learning and and you don't want to stop learning and I think as long as you're willing to do that your future will be secured I think we've got to move away from this belief that I do a degree or I do this thing and then I've arrived you've never arrived you've got to keep learning you've got to keep an open mind and you've got to recognize that you have no clue what the curveball is that you're going to get and then think very carefully about the opportunity presents but it's been profoundly interesting listening to folk who are so much younger than me. Yeah, I mean, you know, you're absolutely right. Uh, I think from, from my point of view, um, in the profession of, of teaching or education, you know, it's, there's a lot of stereotypes attached to that. But, you know, I, I made a big career change uh, somewhere along the line to move from um, engineering to teaching. And, you know, in reflection on that, one of the hardest things I ever did in my life was was going through that change, uh, especially at the age that I was at. You know, the, the older you get, the harder it becomes to to adapt to change. When you're young, um, it's just part of the human condition. You, you, you tend to be more pliable, and you can handle those things. Um, when when you get older, it gets more difficult. But um, yeah, it's one of the the hardest, but also one of the most rewarding things that that I've done. And you know, it's been it's 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 been great for me to listen to to the things that you guys have said, and there's so much that sort of I can resonate with. Um, but really, in terms of looking at the, the the broader scheme or the the bigger picture, you know, the ultimate goal for engineers and architects is to is to construct a better future um, for for humanity, for the human condition. And the human condition is is complex, of course. Um, you know, and you can approach it from a hard, hard science point of view. You can approach it from a, a soft, the soft sciences, the the interpersonal skills, the, the understanding of what it what it means to actually to be a complex human being uh, going forward. Uh, and and there's there's no simple answer to that. 
Um, but exactly as you said, uh, Prof, is just the, the willingness to, um, to A, be prepared to change your mind and, and B, um, be willing to learn, to learn something new. So, yeah. I just want to check whether we've had any questions coming through. Um, I haven't received anything from Alan. Um, okay, he's busy sending me something now. <laughs> okay, I think uh, he's given us the the, uh, the checker flag. So um, I think on that note, gents, uh, I'd like to call an end to this webinar. And, and once again, from my side, um, it's been a massive privilege. And, and thank you very much for giving up your time to attend. And goodbye. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's been great fun. Thanks so much, everyone. Yeah, nice to see all of you. Yeah.